All, All right. right. Take it Let away, Chris. My screen. All right, here we go. How is everybody today? Thanks so much for joining. So, uh, my name is Chris Wilcox, uh, and today here we're talking about uh, velocity scripting. You guys can see my screen. We good? Cool. Um, so this is really about getting started with velocity. Uh, so just to give you guys, for those of you who I haven't met yet, I feel like I've, I see a lot of familiar faces and names in here. Uh, my name is Chris Wilcox. I work at Hartford Funds, I'm the Director of Digital Marketing and Automation there. Um, from a Marketo relevance experience perspective, I'm at MCE, or wait, what's the new the new horrible acronym uh, for whatever it is? Where I'm the new one too. Uh, I'm a three times Marketo champion. So for the last few years, I've been a champ um, and just kind of a full stack uh, specialist. Um, Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, and on the, the Marketo community. Links are in here. So when we, we send this out, you guys can find me if you want to. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about velocity scripting. So th this deck originated from like, when I first started using Marketo, I felt like there was a lot of resources about like, you should use velocity, but not what that means and like how to start and the context around what it is. So I tried to kind of put something together that steps people through what it is, why it matters and how we can get started using it. Um, so we're going to talk about kind of what it is, when maybe you should be using it. Um, there's, there's, there's a million ways to get things done in Marketo as everybody knows. Uh, so it's really on a case by case basis, but um, kind of talk through some of the, the things I consider there. tools of the trade, best practices, those kinds of things, and then how to create, and really testing your tokens. And then we'll talk through a couple use cases. Uh, so, some of this gets a little dry because we're gonna be talking about code. Um, just stick with me because when we get into examples, it all starts making sense and we can uh, and we can go from there. So first and foremost, you know, what is velocity scripting? It's a coding language. Uh, it's, it's based off of Java. So it's based off kind of a, a Java code base, which you don't need to know Java to figure out velocity. I don't know Java, um, but what really matters is you can use it uh, to create script tokens that you can put inside emails, all right? Um, Velocity can read things on your contact object, so fields and information about your contacts or your people or whatever you wanna call it. It can also, if you're using like a, a CRM, can read opportunity data. It can access custom objects if you have them enabled and synced to your Marketo instance. And all of those things can be used kind of together to create more advanced logic, to create dynamic content. And that's really what it is. It's about serving and creating dynamic content in a more powerful way than like traditional snippets or kind of dynamic content with segmentations can, can do. Um, and it's just more robust than those things. And more, most importantly, it's not that scary. <laughs> like people hear code and they go, I'm not a developer. Like I personally am not a developer. That's not my background. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a marketing automation professional. It's not scary. Um, it can get scary, but it doesn't need to be. Um, so when should we be thinking about using velocity? So if you have to reference like multiple attributes about a contact at the same time, like I can't express how many times it's like, well, We'll use segmentation, then it's like, it's like three or four attributes you want to look at. And then all of a sudden you multiply those and you have to make like 60 segments to accommodate all the different combinations of field one and two and three. So a really you know, simple example is you want to combine a gender field and last name to make like a dynamic, hello, Mr. or Mrs. or Miss last name, right? It's just combining things together. It can do that very, very simply. Um, or show or hiding content based on preferences or other information that we know about them. So instead of having to create a segment to show or hide a piece of content, you can just use logic inside a token um, to show or hide a piece of content. And it's a whole lot easier to look at three or four or five attributes to show or hide something than make three or four or five or 50 segments. Um, Beth, who's actually on the call, has a good masterclass piece on a community that talks about kind of tokens versus snippets versus dynamic content, um, which I, I feel like is a good resource for people who are like trying to figure out what they should be doing because it really does come down to your use cases. Um, so, so check that out. Um, but in a lot of cases, velocity scripts, while yeah, they're code, can be a whole lot easier to maintain at like for like really big scale stuff um, than segmentations or snippets or, or dynamic content. Like a big one that I always say is like, I have a custom uh, like hello first name 
that's a token that looks for things like weird characters in the nickname field in Salesforce because our sales reps sometimes will you know put a note to themselves or or have a typo or something in that nickname field and that'll show up on an email right if if you use that in a regular token so you can kind of scrub against you know you can quality check things too so you can use it for things like that pretty pretty easily some limitations you should be aware of if you're going to start poking around with velocity um, you can't nest um, like script tokens within script tokens you can't write one script and then reference it in another script token right um, you can only reference kind of direct fields on the contact or custom objects or opportunities or things like that you can't put one inside the other it won't work that way and and you can't use script tokens within snippets or dynamic content although I don't know if that's 100% of the time. It does not typically work. If someone here knows the real answer, I'd love to know it. But it, it usually doesn't work if you try to run it. Because if you think about showing or hiding a script token and then it executing, it kind of can, can uh, combine on itself pretty quickly. So it would make sense to me. It doesn't work. But I've seen it work in one or two weird scenarios. So, But typically, you can't, you can't bank your, on that. So can't put them inside dynamic content. So. To get started with this, like I just want to talk through some some kind of tools of the trade that that I have found to be way more helpful, um, just to kind of set yourself up for success to start. So, we have like where do you work to build tokens, right? And there's like the Marketo editor, which is in the UI um, that you can access, and I'll show you guys where it is. Um, I feel like it can be a little finicky. Um, it's a small like you know, light box that pops up. It's not a large area to work in a lot of code. Um, can be a little finicky. It's always online. So if you, you know, lose your network connection, sorry, you're, you've lost your work. Um, it, it's a big pro though, is it can very easily access kind of field names because we'll, I'll show you where we can grab those in here. Um, but personally, uh, you can use an offline editor. I like no, that Notepad++. There's in the, in the um, appendix of this, there's like, you can get it so Notepad++ uh, will actually style itself the way uh, the Marketo editor will, like the color coding, um, to make it a little easier to, to QA your tokens. I have some instructions on how you can set that up if you want to work in Notepad. Um, I like it because it's always offline. I can save you know, a file of my token if I want to. Don't have to worry about being disconnected. However, it does not have any direct connection to Marketo, so it doesn't know the fields that I want to reference. So it's kind of, it's it's key downside, but I do recommend using an offline editor. Um, kind of best practices, Marketo does not keep track of changes to your tokens, right? It tells you when it was updated last, not what was changed. There's no history. So keep an offline archive. That's what I do, right? I'm going to update something. I just save a new version of the, the, the file on my shared drive, and then I upload it into, into the Marketo editor to actually be used. Um, it's really easy to restore old stuff if you break something, and you will definitely break stuff. Uh, testing around with velocity. Um, I always, I, big time, I'm a big documentation person. So you can use um, uh, comments, which we'll get into. You can actually add kind of instructions or information about what a piece of code does right into the file itself. That'll really help if you know you or three or five or 10 people are trying to work on the same thing. Kind of good, good best practice there. And then um, it's a little more advanced, but be aware of field types. So like, Marketo only and CRM fields, they get converted to a string, all right, when they're used in velocity. If you're not familiar with what that means, it means, you know, if you want to do um, math, like field one plus field two equals your output, you have to convert them into numbers first because a string is like, Marketo just thinks of it as text. So just be aware if you're trying to work mathematically with number fields, you have to kind of do a little bit of, of massaging of those numeric values before you can do that. I don't know how many people need to do math in here, but I'm just telling you. All right, so getting started. So where you store your tokens in Marketo matters. Um, so you can store them either in a, an activities folder or in a program. Um, if you can see here on the right, when you mouse over a, you know, a folder or a program, there's a tab for my tokens. That's where tokens are created and housed and are saved. And they're accessible to any subfolder and program that are below wherever it's saved. So for example, in this screenshot here, every single program and folder below that parent Chris Wilcox folder can see and access any tokens I create there. If I made it one layer lower, it's just the stuff below that, nothing above it. So just be intentional about where you put things. 
right? You need a global token. Everyone's going to use it in every email as high up in the chain as you can go. Something specific to a campaign or an initiative or a program maybe should be localized to that program. Um, so that, that's definitely a case by case. Uh, the, big, the big thing to keep in mind here, if you go into a child folder where a token is accessed, you can like overwrite the parent version locally uh, and it gets overridden. Honestly, it just, I think overriding tokens is very weird. Just be aware that you don't accidentally update a token in the wrong spot. Always make sure you're going to like the highest level before you modify a token because it'll it'll break stuff. And that's a little confusing. We'll we'll talk about it later. So creating a script token. So now we kind of get like we have our editor set up. We kind of get we, we need to make sure we know where we're going to put our token. Um, we know what we want our token to do. What 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 do I actually what do I actually do to start doing this right? Um, so we're going to talk about code syntax for a few minutes. So like at, at its very core, velocity is just a giant if this, then that problem, right? If a record matches a certain set of criteria or conditions, do a thing or show a thing or whatever. That's, that's how it works. Now, that can get complicated. But in a lot of the times when I use uh, velocity, it's not. So the primary kind of query operators is, you know, you know, you use this hash mark at the beginning of every line. So if uh, starts an if statement, works just like Excel. If you've ever done an if statement in Excel, you know, if something happens, if something equals something or contains something, show something. The next one is else if. So that allows you to do kind of multiple if statements. So you put in, start with an if statement, someone doesn't qualify for it. You can do an else if, and it'll say, hey, you know, if the first statement is if record, you know, type equals one, do this. If not, else if, try this. You, know, you can have many, many, many of those, as many as you need, really. At the bottom, you kind of have an else, which means, what's the default? If someone fails every if statement you've put before it, what should I do for everyone else, right? You know, if not, for everybody else, do this. And then you end the script with, a, with a, an end tag. Um, don't forget your end tag, because you'll get really weird error messages when you try to approve or ten, send a test email. But you'll be like, I have no idea what this is. This is scary. It's probably you're just missing an end tag um, and doesn't actually finish the code. So that's kind of the start. So it's right, it makes sense. If this, if not, do this, if not, do this. For everybody else, do this thing and then end. That's how you structure one of these things. Now, from there, you combine those with rules, right? Uh, so you have different operators and something equal, something contains, check if the field is empty, check if it's not empty, check if it equals something, doesn't equal something. And you can combine those with ands and ors. So if this means this and this, do this, right? It's just like a logic statement of uh, like, and, and if this, then that. And these are how those things are expressed in velocity code. So if field name equals a value, do this. If it doesn't equal, that, that's, pretty much all how it works. And like I said, you can combine those. You have to use parentheses. You group them together inside of parentheses to combine them. So you can see in this example down here, if lead field name is one and lead field name two is two, that, that person would pass because you can see there's parentheses around kind of the whole group. Um, so that makes sense. True and true false fields like Booleans should be, it's a one or a zero, right? Uh, true is one, zero is false. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if you're doing, um, I kind of have a, a, a note down here. If you want to use contains, just make sure you're standardizing the code because it's case sensitive. So you can do, I have it down here. You can set everything to lowercase and then do your contains. That way you're accounting for, for case sensitivity just by forcing everything to be lowercase. Um, but otherwise, you're just combining those if statements and these logic statements. That's the whole thing. Now, that sounds like, I think it seems pretty straightforward, at least, you know, ideally, like from a, from a conceptual level, it can be a little tricky writing it out uh, from, from a code standpoint, but, you know, you get, the more you do it, the better it'll get. Um, it can get super, super complicated, um, but we don't need it to be. Um, it's only if you really need it to be. So the other thing, you can add comments. So if you start a line with the two hash marks at the beginning, um, Velocity will ignore everything that comes after that before return. So you can make notes to yourself, write in it. Like I said, I like to comment out everywhere so that anyone else that accesses the code can see exactly what's happening. They don't need to ask me. It's right there in context with whatever the code is. Um, something else to keep in mind, people will only qualify 
for the like people will get the output of the first if statement they match, right? Not all. So if you need them to do multiple things, you'll have to have separate if statements for each, and then each one they qualify for, they would export. They would, they would kind of have an output for. But if you have like if, else if, else if, else if, whichever one they hit first, that person's done. They're not going through the rest of the logic. That's where they end. Um, so yeah, you just need to have separate kind of full on if statements. Like if this is true, do this. And, and then you have another one. If statements, this, do this. And if you need multiple outputs for one person, if that makes at all sense. We'll talk about it again. Um, so here's the structure, right? So you combining those two things, you have your first if statement at the top, and then you show what should we do for people who meet the criteria in your logic. Um, and you can use tokens there. Else if, as many additional sets of criteria that you have that you need to based on whatever it is you're trying to achieve from a personalization standpoint. And then again, you kind of repeat, rinse and repeat the else ifs as long as you need to. And you've, when you're done all your options, your else, default for everybody else who didn't meet the criteria um, for when this was, and then you close out your token. That's that's the whole basic structure of, of how these things work. Um, so the biggest question I get asked a lot of time is like, how do I know what field names to use, right? I want to say, hey, if field X is true, do, do a thing, what, what do I use for field name? If you open the Marketo um, token editor, which I'll show you guys specifically where you can get to it, it's in that My Tokens um, tab, when you're on a folder or a program and you just drag a script token over and the editor is right there. Um, you literally can drag the field onto the, onto the window and it tells you <laughs> um, what the field name is. You can remove the brackets. You don't really need them. Um, and that's, that's a best practice. Again, I'm not a developer. I've just been told every time, take those brackets off and I say, yes, sir. So I don't know. Um, but that's the easiest way to find them. So all the fields you need to use in a token, like if I'm making a new token, um, I kind of, I'll write down the logic kind of in, in regular human speak, right? Um, I want this to happen, then this to happen, then this to happen. And I'll kind of make a list of what fields that I'll need to be able to, to achieve that, drag them all in, I'll get all my field names and I kind of have my library offline now of, of the fields I want to reference to make to make some new logic. So here's, this is where I feel like things start to make more sense. So, so thank you for sticking with me through code talk because now we're gonna talk personalization, right? So here's a really basic example. And I'm not saying this is a real example, but let's say you wanted to personalize the from name field, right? On an email to show the contact sales rep name if they are in sales group three or four and they're in the West region. So here you've got basically four attributes, three, three attributes that you're querying on and two that you're using to personalize, right? If you wanted to do this as a, as a, as a segmentation, you'd have a, a segment for every sales group and every region, right? To, to account for what you want to achieve here, right? You need to have East, West, North, Midwest, sales groups, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? You, you're going to have a hundred of these things, but here it's very, very simple to achieve a personalization. So you can see I have the, the starting comment. I have a comment at the top. It's telling you what it does. And then the first tip statement, you know, if sales group equals three, the two pipes are the or statement. If you remember from back, you don't have to memorize that stuff. Like you'll, you'll have this, the two pipes is an or. So if lead equals three or lead sales group equal four, you can see there's a close parentheses because that's one criteria, right? It's an or statement. And their region is West. The output for people who meet that criteria, first name, last name fields of the sales owner. For everybody else, it's the brand name, right? So a really simple way that you can create a quick personalization element for people in sales groups three and four who were in the West without making 800 uh, segments. Now, theoretically, you could go make an ad hoc segment right just for this group and do it that way, but that feels like a lot of work to to just achieve this kind of on a, especially if you want to do it all the time. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'll, I'll pause here for some questions around, can I help clarify stuff? Cause I want to talk through more examples, but I want to make sure people don't have kind of underlying questions about how velocity works and those kinds of things before I, before I keep going. Let me look at the chat. I got one, Chris, just. Yeah. Cause... Yep. Yep. So if you have and and or, uh, yeah. is there a not and not or? 
like would it be like an exclamation before the pipes or an exclamation before the and yeah ampersands? if you want it so yeah exactly it's an exclamation so to to say in in most of these coding scenarios uh for at least within velocity to say not equals right or not contains you put an exclamation mark in front of that dollar sign at the beginning of the variable so if you wanted this to say not groups three and four right you just put an exclamation mark in front of both and it would say anyone whose sales group is not three or is not four but technically i think everybody would qualify for that because everyone like yeah. but you'd have to make an and in that scenario because you'd say they're not three and they're not four um I, I think it's helpful like my the way i think is i kind of literally with like i'll type it out in full text this is what i want to achieve with my logic right hey for this pe this group of people i want to do this for this group of people i want to do this then i can wrap my head around let's translate that into actual code work uh thereafter thank you yep anybody else things i can help clarify i know it's a lot and you'll get the deck and like there's a learning curve for sure but just getting getting kind of started with how does it work um and get your get your toes wet. Okay, well, I'm gonna keep going. Um, stop me if you guys want, that's fine. So um, next, so creating your token, this is where you actually do it. So you navigate and I can do this. We can, I have uh, an instance open in the background which we can jump into, but you just navigate to where do you wanna build it? Go to your My Tokens tab, right? Drag a velocity uh, script token over into the, the off the off the right rail into the pane, the working pane. You'll name it there. It'll ask you to name it, just like if you're creating a text token or a date token or whatever. And then you'll hit. There's an edit button that pops up, and it'll show you the the editor that looks like this. So then, like me, I work offline, right? So I write all this code offline in my uh, in my text editor. I paste my code in here. And something that you have to remember is any fields that you need to reference in your logic. On this right side of the editor, there's this big long um, field list of all the fields that are available to Velocity. You got to check the box next to the ones you want to use. And that basically gives that script access to those fields. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? Because it won't be able to actually read the information that's in those fields. So a bit important, important little caveat there. So you paste your code in, go through, check the boxes of the fields you need to look at, and then, then you're good. That's referencing either for logic or for personalization, just any field it needs to use. Right. Now testing gets a little tricky sometimes. So testing your token, you got really two options. You can send, you know, emails to leads that meet your conditions, right? You can create some test leads, send some test emails, um, or, or view them in the editor here as a person, um, that kind of thing, or put, you know, real leads in a static list and preview by that and kind of scroll through and test them. Um, you know, I, I think, Sanford would tell you you have to send real emails, right? Because there's definitely scenarios where a test email doesn't work exactly the same way a production email does, like on the back end, like in a technical sense. I have not encountered it that much personally. Um, so I, I have found kind of sending test emails, view, viewing uh, previews, either by person that I know meet my criteria or creating test leads that I know meet my criteria or don't um, has been sufficient for me. Um, so, you know, test your things thoroughly. Um, those are really your best bets, though, from a testing perspective. Um, and then uh, let's talk about another example. So this is one that I've, I've I heard uh, a bunch of people talk about before, just conceptually. So you've got, let's say your company's doing, you know, well, <laughs> no one's at conferences now, but when we're at conferences again, and you know, you've got a, an iPad at your booth and you're collecting leads, uh, and let's say you're asking the leads as they go through the form fill, you know, which of these three pieces of content interest you, right, as you collect their information. Um, th those, those options will come through in, you know, field A and B and C, right, which ones are true, which ones are not. Um, and you want to have one email that shows the stuff they picked and didn't, doesn't show the stuff that they didn't pick, right? Now, if you want to do this with segmentations, you'd have to build a segmentation for every combination of these three fields that exists, right? They have a, field A, yes, but not to, uh, B or C, field B, but not A or C, so on. I'm not going to go on through all of them. There's like 15, right, because of the math. Uh, or you write one token here, and essentially your if statement, you can see, is very simple. Hey, if field A is true, is one, 
and you drop your your HTML in there for whatever that content block is, right? Um, and then you end that statement right there. And this is what I was talking about. If you need someone to be able to have multiple outputs, you can see how I have separate opened and closed if statements inside this one token. So you've got one for field A and it ends right here, mm -hmm. right? One for field B, one for field C. Um, there are other ways to do this too. Like an interesting way I've seen some people do it so that their content teams who are building emails don't have to like no code to get an HTML email out. Um, the tokens actually just either add or delete comments out. So it actually just comments out a content block, um, like from an HTML, like adding it, making it disappear essentially. Um, so there's multiple ways at, at these kinds of problems, but you know, just a, a simple example of that. I feel like a lot of people can kind of wrap their head around. Anybody, does this make sense? Any questions on this one? Okay. Um, so another one I have in here, I'm not sure if Warren joined. He told me he may. <laughs> um, but Warren sent me one because there was some some chatter going on. I don't see him on here, but uh, about this is definitely advanced. Okay, this is where this is where I said things can get crazy. You can see how quickly code becomes a little a little nuts. Um, but this is for people, there's a lot of trouble out there. Uh, I'm not sure how many people access add to calendar buttons for events that they're hosting or their teams are hosting. Um, but there's this, you know, Outlook versus Google Calendar problem of what works and what doesn't work for multiple uh, platforms. And uh, Sanford has his, you know, Agile uh, platform, which if you're not familiar with it, it's um, a way to create calendar like ICS files on the fly. Um, and what this, this whole script does is, and the top here in this section 01 setting variables, you basically put all the information about your event right in here. And what this outputs, I can show you the, the whole set of code is a link to add to Outlook and a link to add to Google Calendar that both work efficiently for both, they work, work correctly for either platform. So I think a lot of people have this problem of creating you know, multiple add to calendar tokens this is trying, this is attempting to simplify it. So more examples of this is definitely going down the more advanced path uh, from a logic standpoint. But you know, if you're se if you're sending out tons of invites and you're making multiple tokens per, because you need one to work for, G for Google Calendar, one to work for, uh, for Outlook, you know, this can save a lot of time. Um, so just closing out before we kind of jump in and talk through things a little more if we if we want to talk about some specific stuff. So uh, one weird thing, when that Marketo editor first loads, um, like when you create your token and hit edit, it takes like three, maybe five seconds for that like integration pane on the right side to actually show anything. Like it would usually open and it's just blank. Then all of a sudden everything will pop up. If you start editing, I have found if you start editing <laughs> in like the working area of that while it hasn't loaded, it can it can mess stuff up. So just when you open that editor, be patient for a second, wait till the integration pane loads, then start your work and you'll just avoid that at all times. I've had like major pull my hair out moments because uh, I just started working too quickly. Um, and if you have to do it, you basically have to go in, uncheck everything in the integration, save your token, reopen it, recheck everything in integration and it fixes it. It's a giant pain. So just be mindful of that. Um, and sometimes that integration pane never loads and you can do that like control shift R kind of hard refresh, dumping your cache, and it usually fixes it um, for first try there. So if you run into that. Um, so in summary, here's your checklist, right? Get your, you know, you can set up your offline editor if you want. You know, I'm a big proponent of it. Um, write out your logic rules. Like this is where I said, I like to do it with like pseudocode, um, writing down your rules and sentences. It just really can help you get in the right, like what am I trying to do, right? Before you step into code world. Um, and then use that Marketo editor to pull all the fields you're going to be using in your logic. So now you've got everything that you need to actually create the code. So write your logic conditions and if statements using your fields. Um, and then find where you want to create your token in Marketo, right? So make sure you're putting it in the right place in the, in the folder hierarchy. Add the token, open it in the editor. Once the integration pane loads, uh, paste your content in, check the boxes next to the fields that you're referencing either built in test cases or find them and start previewing and sending test emails and kind of QA from there. 
it sounds easy. Uh, it's a little challenging at first, but you know, if you understand how the logic works and how these things get structured, at least for, for basic personalization, um, it's not hard to get started. It's especially there's, there's stuff that pops up where I'm like, I can do that in velocity a whole lot faster than I can do it with people creating dynamic content in, in an email every time they have to send it or something like that. So lots of use cases where it, where it works more quickly. Um, some resources, there's like official velocity documentation, which I don't find helpful. It's not all inclusive of everything it can do, but it's a place. Uh, the Marketo community, um, there's a link here for, to add, well, I have to check the link, but everything where velocity is tagged, right, as a topic, you can search in there. Community is a great place for it. Sanford Whiteman's blog is amazing. Uh, as, as always, he's a, an absolute a wizard uh, from, from a velocity standpoint. And then like Google <laughs> like and GitHub are, are like real resources that I find myself on pretty regularly when it comes to trying to figure out stuff. Last week I was trying to get um, some, I don't remember, even remember the, the asset ID of an of a email into a token and it's this whole big long piece of code, you know, someone had on Google. And I just was like pasted it and it worked, it was good. So um, good resources out there for sure. So that's my whole presentation here. Um, I don't know if we want to walk through looking at some of those examples more or more talk about it. Um, I kind of defer to the group of what would be most helpful um, to kind of clarify things and getting people feeling more comfortable about, about velocity.